So thank you so much for having me here today. It's been inspiring to hear all these different speakers and I think you'll hear me talking about a lot of the same things that they spoke about. Now I'm here in Traverse City today because I co-founded and run an organization called Global Giving. It is one of the original crowdfunding platforms we started back in 2002 when crowdfunding as a term hadn't really been invented yet. And today we have sent over $140 million to over 7,000 organizations in 155 different countries from over 300,000 people just like you. And the story I want to tell you today is my personal journey. And why is it worth telling? Because I think I am the least likely social entrepreneur I've met and that you are probably likely to meet. And let me tell you why. So I grew up as an only child. I happened to grow up in Japan and Italy and Germany. Complicated story. Um, I was a good student. I was very rule abiding. I learned to play the piano. You get the picture, right? Um, I was also extremely self-sufficient, and, and this was because my um, mother had happened to get into a very serious car accident when I was about one, and family lore has it that by age three I was helping my mom get dressed in the mornings, so training does pay off. And notwithstanding the fact that I was a good student and did well at school, because I was a Japanese girl, there was no guarantee that I was going to go on to college. Um, I really wanted to go to an American college. American colleges were expensive. My parents said, well, if we're going to shell out that kind of money, it better be a college we recognize. And as you might imagine, that list was extremely short. And basically, they said, well, if you can't make it into one of those colleges, you can always go back and become what's called an OL in Japan. That actually stands for office lady. And you can imagine. <laughs> There are magazines devoted to these uh, professions, um, if you want to call it that. Um, so I did make it to college. But if I think back on what I was like in college, I was sort of a loner. Um, I was academically inclined. Um, I cleaned houses like every good immigrant. And um, I you know, was expecting to go out into the workforce, and I fully expected that I would make it on the strength of being the hardest working person and the most reliable person in the room at any given time. And by a fluke, I ended up working for the World Bank, although I had trained to become uh, a Sovietologist. Now this room, I think the demographics are such that you actually know what a Sovietologist, except for the high school students who are here. That's someone who used to specialize in something called the Soviet Union, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, anyway, I was a Sovietologist, but as I was studying in grad school, the, my unit of analysis fell apart. Soviet Union didn't exist anymore. I thought, this PhD is not really worth pursuing. I'll go and find a job. And the job happened to be at the World Bank, which I knew nothing about, but I knew something about the Soviet Union, and they seemed to care about that, so I got hired. Um, most people who, got, who get hired by the World Bank are economists, and I was not an economist, so I was a political scientist. Um, but I figured, how, how hard could it be? It's probably going to be just like school. And it actually was, you know? I was given assignments, I got my mind around them, uh, there were competencies that were laid out for me, I worked my way through them. So I made my way through the ranks, and it was actually the perfect place for me. I was, um, you know, a multicultural brat, so I ended up going to different countries, operating in different cultures and contexts and uh, languages, and never belonging to any of them. I was, you know, I'd grown up as a permanent expat. This was a perfect job. And it was actually also a great job. It paid well, and it allowed me to fly in, you know, airplanes like that. That's a Concorde, for those of you, again, who are too, <laughs> too young to realize what that is. Um, and my bosses love me because, you know, having grown up sort of uh, anticipating my mother's needs, I sort of fell right into that model of being able to anticipate my boss's needs before they even told me what they needed. So, and then I decided to leave. And people asked me, why are you leaving the World Bank? Why did you leave the World Bank? And I had no good answer at the time. Um, 
for a long time, I had no good answer. But I think looking back at my trajectory from sort of not being sure I'd go to college to becoming a Sovietologist to then working at the World Bank, founding Global Giving, if I look back and think about the pattern there, it's really about giving up my belief in myself. Now, how, you know, well, what's, what's with that? Like giving up my, your belief in yourself? You know, didn't the Atlantic have a cover story just last week about the confidence gap? and how we under-promise uh, over promise and over-deliver, and that means that we don't get the promotions and the raises and visibility that we deserve, and isn't leaning in all about you know, accelerating so that you don't get yourself pushed out into a slow lane. Well, and you know, isn't founding an organization the ultimate egomaniacal thing to do? Um, it is. You have to basically get up there and say, look, I've got some vaporware here, but I've got this grand vision, and trust me, it'll all turn out okay. The, the truth is, I wasn't very good at selling. I wasn't very good at doing this trust me business. And so I was so terrible at it, in fact, that my co-founder said, no, you, sh you shouldn't even try to do this uh, raising money stuff. <laughs> It was the first time in my life that working hard and being the most reliable person in the room hadn't worked out for me. It just wasn't enough. And it wasn't enough because I was painfully aware that what I represented, what my co-founder and I represented, was so minuscule compared to the big idea that we were trying to paint. And the big idea we were trying to paint is that if traditional aid and philanthropy had been done in a model where experts were flown in from outside to a developing country, and the developing country was told what to do, and they would implement it. We had this idea that we would support local leaders, and we would, they would not have access to the experts or the financial uh, resources that places like the World Bank had, but we ultimately thought that that was a much more promising way to actually get development. And, you know, it was, it was a, radical new idea, we thought it had great promise, and it had been done. I'm not saying that no one before us had come up on the idea of supporting local leaders. They had, but what we were trying to say and what we were trying to sell is that we were going to do it at scale. We were going to find thousands of local people to support. If you recall, John Williams showed a picture of an AIDS orphanage. So there are hundreds thousands of informal such places in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, taking care of AIDS orphans, and they're mostly run by grandmothers. Grandmothers who have lost their uh, daughters and sons to the AIDS epidemic. And they do it because it is the right thing to do, and it is the only thing to do. And what if I could connect those scores of grandmothers to grandparents here, and the grandparents here could support them? You know, the, the, the idea of sort of growing this exponential organization, connecting all these uh, local leaders was, was thrilling, but it was extremely difficult to do. You have to remember in 2002, this was before Twitter, before Facebook, before WhatsApp. It's even before Airbnb. And so, you know, I'm trying to explain this and people are kind of looking at me like, I, I'm not quite getting what you're describing and I don't quite believe you. So of course it was really hard to sell. And then, you know, just as um, we were getting started, um, a few years in, my uh, co-founder and I, I'm married to my co-founder, decided that perhaps this was not the most rational way to sort of sink all our household uh, risk into this one extremely tenuous organization, so he decided that maybe one of us should go get a real job. There I was stuck with trying to sell an organization that I had a really painfully difficult time selling. And this is where I got really lucky. Because as I was trying to build this organization that was going to serve thousands of social entrepreneurs around the world and hundreds of thousands of supporters, it became clear to me that the difference between bottom up and top down isn't just a theoretical difference. It's actually a question of what you believe is going to be the engine of adaptability, power, and passion. And if you believe 
that that comes from the local leader, then it was going to also be important for me to design an organization that actually believed that, which, me, which is to say that it's not about me, it's about every other person in the organization down to the student intern who is working at Global Gaming for a semester. And if I was going to build that type of an organization, I needed to make sure that, there were, that I got every rule and process and layer of oversight out of the way to empower these people. And so I set out to build an organization minimize rules, minimize processes, minimize oversight, but was founded around some values. And we arrived at a set of values that starts with always open. And we're always open because good ideas can come from anyone, anywhere, any place. And we have to make sure that our preconceived expectations of what, who comes up with good ideas or where they come from don't get in the way of actually discovering the great ideas. The next value we settled on was listen, act, learn, repeat, because essentially we, have, we start by listening to our stakeholders and the people we serve. We act, we learn through action rather than study, and then once we've learned, we repeat. We don't necessarily repeat the mistakes, but we just go back into listening acting and learning. The next value we came up with was committed to WOW. And I feel very strongly about this because so often the poor and the people in vulnerable communities end up not getting world-class service. And they are exactly the people who deserve the best possible service from nonprofits and social enterprises. And so we were determined to create world-class service for the social entrepreneurs we served as well as for the person who was just having trouble getting online and donating $10. And finally, the last value we came up with was never settle. Never settle because just because we master one game doesn't mean that the next game isn't going to be tougher or that the rules aren't going to change. And so these are our four core values. I was insistent that we had to come up with only maximum four because they, if they were going to be a guide to action, if they were going to allow us to filter everything we do from hiring someone to promoting someone uh, to um, actually figuring out what's on your to-do list every day, there were going to only be four because that was a maximum that I could remember on any given day. And so there were no accidental values, such as, you know, we, we have a lot of very young people on staff, so we tend to party hard, but party hard is not one of our values. Um, <laughs> honesty is not a value, because as far as I'm concerned, that's like a threshold value that if you're not honest, we're not even talking to you. So, and I also, you know, I was being curmudgeonly at the time, I also said, by the way, you must not come up with any values that can be, you know, sort of portrayed like this with a sunset. And, you know, the, again, it was just my being curmudgeonly, but I was lucky because what we ended up with is not a set of attributes, but a set of rules or precepts about how to act. And act is what you do in the wor at work every day. And the four values that we came up with allowed for diversity of approaches but it told you what to do on any given day with any given customer, with any given problem. And it was also a stroke of luck for me because what happened when I came up with those four values is I finally found a community for me. Now, as I explained to you, I grew up something of a loner. And I don't think I fully realized how much of a loner I was until I created Global Giving and suddenly found myself in a group that felt like I belonged to it. And it's probably blindingly obvious to, to most of you in the room, but it wasn't blindingly obvious to me, that it is much easier to face challenges when you feel like you are part of us rather than you are just representing yourself. And this accidental discovery is really the only thing that allows me to stand in front of you today and claim to be a social entrepreneur. 
Because it's one thing to be creative and to innovative and buck tradition. Arguably, I was all that before uh, this. But it's very different to do so from a place of connectedness and being in service. And I couldn't get here until I had shed certain beliefs about myself. And while it's important to believe in yourself, I do think that sometimes those beliefs get in the way of what you can do. And it's so, so it's much easier for me today to say, trust us, we'll do some awesome things with your money, and we will do some awesome things with, uh, with the expertise and the passion and everything that you bring to global giving. And the moral of the story is that the power of an us, you know, the, the, the global giving community is, is a direct manifestation of that. It's thousands of social entrepreneurs and hundreds of thousands of supporters. It's also evident in my story where I didn't feel empowered to go out there and raise money for global giving until I felt like I was part of a tribe. The second moral is that you can create this community around yourself, as, as I did. And I've thought about that a lot lately, because my husband and I adopted a son three years ago. He's now six. Now, the very act of adoption sort of subverts the whole idea of the family of origin, right? I mean, family of origin is where you were born. He's not from our family. So that's, that's, pro that's one thing. The other, you know, so I don't know if any of you have read Andrew Solomon's book, Far From the Tree, but he talks about horizontal and vertical identities. You know, his vertical identity is his family. His horizontal identity, Calvin's horizontal identity, is being adopted, is being of Chinese descent. My husband's American, I'm Japanese. It's a problematic relationship between Japan and China. We'll get to that when he gets old enough to understand history. <laughs> Um, he's also profoundly deaf. So, you know, those identities, you know, I, I, I can only hope that he will figure out who his tribe is. But right now, the odds are stacked against him. So I've got to hope and believe that it is entirely possible for one to create a tribe and a community around oneself even if it takes you 40 uh, years or more, as it did me. And increasingly, I'm optimistic because that tribe can be virtual, not real. Several years ago, when we first started uh, letting people comment on projects on global giving, a project leader who was uh, doing organic farming in Guatemala sent out a report saying, we're going to get into chicken raising. And I'm, this is what I'm doing with your money. So we've got the chickens, we're going to lay some eggs, here are our plans, and he posted that report online. And then about a week later, one of his donors wrote in saying, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I think there's something wrong with your chickens. And it turns out it was an organic farmer in Oregon who had supported his project, so he had he received the report. Then he went and said, you know, the, the, the chicken to egg ratio that you've listed on your thing, it, it's, it's not right. There's something wrong with your chickens. Week later, project leader writes back, says, nothing wrong with my chickens. I, there was a problem with the cell in my Excel spreadsheet. You were right. It's much closer to the number you cited. So for that brief moment, the Guatemalan farmer and the farmer in Oregon connected, right? They've never met each other. They never will meet each other. But they're part, very briefly part of a tribe. And they are engaged in a collective venture to uh, promote organic farming in Guatemala. And you see examples of this all over the place. You know, Linux, right? Most of the people who build Linux have ne actually never met each other. That's just an amazing thing. And the power of crowdfunding, to, back, to get back to what I said about global giving, I don't think the power of crowdfunding is in the funding. I think it's in the crowd. And I think the potential is far, far underdeveloped today. And I do think that it is something that is going to develop in ways that we can only, we, we, can, we really can't imagine today. Because that's the power of us. And we have newer and better 
ways of figuring out who our community is, who our tribe is, and have huge expectations of a new world where you can figure out your community and your tribe from anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be necessarily the people you were born to, the people where you grew up. Now the world's your oyster, and that is the power of us. Thank you.